from one dark twin to one that's going to be a very dark twin. This episode clears up the shocking incident at the genesis of the Oshinoko story, concluding many of the questions we had of Aqua's past as Amamiya Goro. While Ruby's past as Serena is just getting started, Akane uses some slick truths to stop Aqua from going out with Arima, and Arima continues to be sea beat by the story. As Aqua's character comes to a close, he is given a new dilemma. As we question, where will the Oshinoko story take us now? Well, that's where the crows come into place as Dark Ruby is born. Spoiler warning guys for Oshinoko Season 2, Episode 12, Episode 23 overall, Saikai. The start of the episode is all about the origins of Amamiya and Serena's relationship as it will be the catalyst for Ruby's trauma. As much as Ruby loved Ai, she probably loves Amamiya just a little bit more. Ane Mone, who is Memcho's friend and music video producer based out in Miyazaki where Aqua and Ruby was born and where Amamiya got yeeted is about to hook Bikomachi up with a creative music video with an original song that producer Himura made that should be an absolute banger. I really do hope the song's good. Out of nowhere, Akane arrives to go along with the trip to Miyazaki with the Bikumachi members, Aqua, and President Strawberry, Miyako. It looks like that strawberry bacon soda licking Arima just keep catching more L's. As they make it to Miyazaki, the crew split up because they are trying to shoot two music videos, getting a lot done in a very short period of time. And while Arima is getting dragged away with her idol members, Aqua and Akane get some alone time at the hospital. Arima just keep catching more and more L's. We get some cute slice of life moments and some darker ones with Aqua's mommy complex walking down with Akane, which reminds him of his pregnant mom. Aqua takes Akane down to the cliff where his pet Amamiya died. This is totally out of Akane's wheelhouse of profiling, but one that wins brownie points for going back to find his dead pet that fell off a cliff. Akane assumes that Aqua has a cute side, but it's actually dark. Akane and Aqua go to his friend's crib where Aqua claims that he was friends with himself. We get some backstory from our soon to be taken a backseat MC saying he grew up with his grandma and grandpa. Obstetric hemorrhage. Amamiya's mother died from losing too much blood when she was giving birth to Garo and never revealing to her parents that she was actually pregnant. Meaning he has double the mommy issues. Like his current situation, he doesn't know who his Amamiya daddy was. And while Garo's relationship with his grandmother was good, his relationship with his grandpa was a bit sour due to the consequences of him being born and his mother being lost because of him. Amamiya lived with tons of guilt and became an obstetrician when in reality he wanted to be a surgeon. A lot of what Aqua is doing now mirrors what he went through in his previous life in a lot of reincarnation or isekais. A lot of the time the MC finds himself in better situations but it looks like for Aqua it mirrors his past life. What he mentions about making decisions to fit in this was brought up with the drunk office ass Kendaichi about orphans that are great actors because they try to fill in the missing void they never had his kids like Himekawa Taiki, like Hoshino Ai, and like Amamiya Goro. A very important moment occurs as the details of Serena's passing comes to light through Aqua's flashback. Goro is totally pissed off at Serena's parents refusing to take the time to see the passing of their dying daughter as they were just too busy. While we may question Goro and Serena's odd relationship given their age gap, Goro was really the only person willing to give Serena some happiness in her life before she passed away. Thus she can tell why Serena fell in love with her doctor. One of the last things Serena told Amamiya was about her being able to go see a Bikomachi concert and receive the keychain out of a toy machine. And so she wanted to get something that she treasured for Amamiya to treasure before her last dying breath. As she laid there in tears, she tells Amamiya, Daisuke. There's nothing like some more dark foreshadowing of a crow in the creepy kid from a couple of episodes ago in the cliffhanger, giving us an overview of Goro and Serena's relationship. Two people, mommy issues, reborn as two people with no souls. Does Arima count? The creepy kid presents the question that there may be a bigger meaning here as to why they were both reincarnated. And why the hell is there a creepy kid just watching over their lives? Who is she? Is she one of these creepy ass crows? 
sometimes with supernatural characters, I am led to believe that majority of the time they are just plot devices. And sometimes they do act as like narrators, which is this character is kind of doing right now. They're kind of like a cheat code to help push the story forward and make sure that the audience is aware of some things, very important things. I'm usually not that big of a fan of a character like this if they do too much in the story. Seeing a character like this actually makes me a little bit more disappointed on potentially how the story could end with their involvement. The beat Komachi original song music video is being shot as the story continues to tease Arima that her crush is going to crush her. Aqua and Akane come back up to catch up with the beat Komachi shooting after their dark and really sad side quest. Since Mimcho is entering Cougar Land with horns, she can work past 10 p.m. But for miners, they can luckily avoid all the Karoshi. Arima tries to put the baking soda on your boy Aqua, but Akane ain't about to let some bell pepper dancing baking soda licking maniac take her man, and apparently she's against Arima working as an idol like it's any of her business. In reality, Akane is just a daifan. She calls over Kana-chan to make sure she looks absolutely stunning and amazing that should win over the world with a simple flick of her wrist. Kana is out here fishing for praise, but Akane and Aqua give her some of that meh. Akane and Aqua watch on as Bikomashi perform their dancing part of the music video. They begin to speculate over why Kana's acting has improved so much as her bubbly nature of wanting to show off her talents are enhanced even more as an idol. Arima's personality really is perfect for an idol. Akane thinks she's slick by blocking Aqua from going on any more dates with Arima, it's totally not because Arima bragged all about it from the previous episode, but it's because of trying to protect her in her image. Of course, due to what happened to Ai, this becomes a viable option for Aqua to seriously consider protecting Arima from weirdos. That is more important than selfishly trying to get with her. Sigh, sigh. I think I can seriously speak for everyone when I say be selfish. If you want a personal relationship, you can't let some potential that might not even exist lunatic fanatic stop you guys from achieving your own happiness. Being an idol means being idolized. That's some random in their mother's basement, in their delusions, thinking that they can clap their favorite idol's cheeks. To keep the facade going, Aqua could have ruined Arima's image and got her shaped like I. So Akane warns him about helping protect her image. Aqua feels that he lacked awareness with that barbecue date, so his next big dilemma as a character as he starts to fall behind Ruby as the main character is to distance himself from the dancing bell peppers and baking soda licking future stuff. Aqua ponders over his new dilemma as a character as Ruby and her new Onechan is having a sleepover. And of course, how many goddamn times are they going to hit at these goddamn crows in this goddamn foreshadowing for this goddamn upcoming disaster? The crow stops itself from being a foreshadowing and actually becomes a part of the plot and snatches the hotel keys while Ruby and Akane chase it down into darkness. Ruby tries to explain herself that she knows the area not because she was reincarnated or anything, but because of some lame ass lie. Ruby suggests that Akane join them in Bikomachi, but Akane brings up that that isn't her lane. I mean, Yuki slapped the wanting to yeet out of her. But in Ruby's case, on the flip side, she wants to be an actor. Hints of this was during the Tokyo Blade arc, where she seemed enamored with everyone's performances. Is her first acting scene gonna be like Aqua's, as, you know, that predator? First and foremost, Ruby wants to be a household name and perform in the biggest venue possible within a dome, like what I was going to do. And she starts to have naughty thoughts about her sensei, like it's the start of some sick nasty hentai. So Ruby asks Akane about age gaps in relationships, and Akane gives the, it's about the mental age, and that 10 years is probably cool. I think you forgot to mention Akane, the legal age of 18. I don't care about any other country's laws right now. Ruby and Akane talk about Aqua's past life as Amamiya and how much he meant to Ruby as Serena. Without Goro, Ruby's will to live and want to become an idol would have never existed as he gave her all the encouragement she needed until the very end. And the very end is here. 
the crow led them to a dead body and it's the dead body that everyone and their mama thinks it is the guy that got yeeted by the same guy that yeeted i it's the rise of the darkness the beginning of a new path of a reincarnated person that apparently doesn't have a soul says this creepy kid the story bringing up the happy levels up until the very end to ruby's most precious memories and fantasies of her now brother finds the decrepit bone chilling dead body of amamiya goro and look at that keychain there's no mistaking it it is here that dark ruby is born if you guys have been skipping the any credits and have finally watched it you already know now this is ruby's story now even though when you expect something to happen and it still sends chills down your spine that probably means the cliffhanger slap hard the first half of the episode really gave us a lot of closure for amamiya i've always wondered how much more does the death of amamiya and him not being found play into the overall scheme of things within the story now we got our answer as it's not so much about the backstory that mattered but it's more about finding the body and who found the body. When it comes to a story like Oshinoko from the manga to the anime, I don't really have that much of a different opinion. The anime does a pretty good job at adapting everything from the manga that I've read. So story-wise, there really isn't anything new to say. At this point, the first half of the episode just informed us about Amamiya's backstory, but how much of it is actually useful for the plot. As of right now, it doesn't really mean that much, but it's nice to know about his past and how much more it connects with his mommy issues. Now, I do joke around a little bit about the mommy issues thing, but it really legitimately is a thing that Serena has, that I has, and Garo has that problem. They all have parental issues and how that connects with creative artists that is an actual real life thing too. And the story saved this episode for the very ending of the cliffhanger of how much Ruby loved Amamiya for this moment. The more that we find out that Ruby really loved Amamiya for this reason being that her parents didn't really care for her, but this one guy did. That makes for the ending and for this dark ruby to matter that much more. Why her motivations start to shift now and why it makes sense for her that's coming up. If we're being real, Serena and Garo's relationship is kind of weird considering their age gap. But from Garo's perspective, he didn't really do anything weird. It's really Serena that's really put that romantic interest into her sensei. Serena legitimately only had Garo to confide in, which is why she has so much feelings for him. If you had no real friends or family that love you and all of a sudden you have this one person that gives you some kind of positivity in your life, you're going to want to at least be friends with that guy. So now I'm pretty excited that they finally found Goro's body and we can already tell by Ruby's eyes that this is a total mental shift for her character. At the same time, I am kind of sad that there's only one more episode, so all the Dark Ruby stuff is really gonna have to wait until like next year or whenever they decide to make a new season. But in the meantime, I'm gonna try to catch up with the manga. I'm not that far ahead. So yeah, guys, let me know what you guys thought about this episode and everything up until this point. Are you guys enjoying the start of this Dark Ruby? And do you guys really care that Aqua's character is taking a back seat? And his dilemma really at this point just becomes him trying to protect the Rima to prevent himself from his own happiness from trying to get with her. So let me know what you guys think. I would love to know. So do me a favor, guys. Hit the like button. Subscribe to the channel if you guys haven't already. Check out my blog at oldtalkinson.com. And I appreciate you guys watching. See you guys on the video.